Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Patty Aaron. I am the public affairs officer for the Lower Colorado Basin Region. Um, welcome to Reclamation's History Webinar Series, and today we're going to focus on Hoover Dam, and we have a fresh look at that. Uh, this is the fifth of a monthly series as we build to Reclamation's 120th anniversary on June 17th, 2022. Um, this event is being recorded, so if you're not interested in being part of that, please disconnect at this time. If you're having technical issues, please disconnect and join again. Uh, additionally, you may have better success connecting to the team app on your computer and not on the web browser. Later, we're going to open it up for questions. And if you have a question, please click on the question mark bubble in the upper right hand corner. We'll do our best to answer all those questions at the end. So today we're joined by Terry Samier. She's the facility services manager for the Lower Colorado Dams office. That office oversees operations at Hoover, Parker, and Davis Dams on the Colorado River. And welcome, Terry. I want to introduce you right now. Thanks, Patty. Um, we're going to jump right in because um, I have quite a few slides. So uh, I want to thank the staff that helped with uh, some of the research and putting this presentation together. We had a lot of fun. Um, when I volunteered to do the presentation on building Hoover Dam, as Patty mentioned, I might have had a little bit of a different take on what that means, because I think the story starts with how did we come to build a dam in the middle of what was at that time, the middle of nowhere. So here's a quick overview of where some of the key features are that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're located in the lower Colorado Basin in Region 8. Um, and the name of the legislation authorizing the construction of Hoover Dam is the Boulder Canyon Project Act. And that provided for construction of a high dam near Boulder Canyon and the All-American Canal in Imperial Valley, California. So obviously there was a connection there. So on the right, you can see uh, where some of the key features are. We're Hoover Dam up here and here's Yuma and here's Imperial Valley. So the earliest documented account of European contact with the native inhabitants of the Colorado River Basin was in the mid 1500s. Uh, Spanish explorers were traveling up the Colorado River from the Gulf of California. They were searching for the seven cities of Cibola. Uh, that was um, supposedly a city made of gold. It was actually just uh, smooth adobe that was reflecting in the sunlight. But important to their story, is that they noted a good river crossing near what today is Yuma. And um, identifying a river crossing was important because the Colorado was wild and unpredictable and had very few good possible crossing points. So the 1680s, Father Kino, he was a priest. He was uh, establishing missions through Arizona, California, and New Mexico. And importantly, again, he documented that crossing at Yuma. And in 1774, uh, Juan Baptista de Anza was sent out to establish an overland route from Mexico to what was at the time Northern Mexico, which is California today. And this established really a trail and a crossing that was used um, uh, for westward uh, migration since that point. So a little bit of context, what was going on in uh, in America at the time. So I think everyone knows 1776, the United States declared independence. And there were some widely held cultural beliefs at the time that really impacted how the people thought about uh, the West. So initially um, it was about American expansion and that was acquiring the lands across North America. And a lot of that had, had to do with the ability to uh, protect the new American country. Um, that later evolved into uh, Manifest Destiny. And Manifest Destiny was the desire to develop all of the lands that they had acquired in North America. State sovereignty um, was a, a very um, strong, strongly held belief that had to do with limited federal involvement in state business. Um, so at the time, infrastructure projects were developed either by the states or uh, by private developers. And in this example, 
the state of New York built the Erie Canal. And the thought of how people thought about what progress was. So it was often thought of as um, uh, exploiting all the natural resources to serve the public good. And this carried on into the 20th century. Um, in 1920, uh, Secretary of the Interior Franklin Lane in a speech, and I'm gonna do bad impressions of the speeches, so pardon me on that. Um, every tree, every pool of water, and every foot of soil is a challenge to us. The mountains are our enemies. We must pierce them and make them serve. The sinful rivers we must curb. So that kind of gives you a context of how people thought about um, you know, developing resources. So early 1800s, America was fast tracking industrial development to compete with Europe. And between 1830 and 1860, the population of the urban areas grew from 1.1 million to 6.2 million. Mechanization of agriculture meant that farmers could uh, work more land. That meant bigger irrigation projects. And there was competing interests in water use for industrial and agricultural development. And this started to really uh, fuel disputes over water rights. So out west, um, 1821, Mexico gained independence from Spain. So at that time, California was northern Mexico. In 1846, the Mexican-American War broke out. It ended in 1848 and established the Rio Grande as the U.S.-Mexico border. In 1848, President James Polk, who was a big proponent of expansionism, uh, played up a small San Francisco newspaper article about um, a gold discovery, and over 300,000 men flooded west, and about a third of those men crossed at Yuma. Well, by 1855, the much overplayed story about the amount of gold in California, the gold rush was over, and a lot of the miners decided to stay, and they brought their families out. So there was a little bit of Western migration um, and settlement. Uh, the biggest impact, though, of the gold rush was it brought really strong federal awareness of the military and economic significance of the West. So Oliver Rosencroft, uh, he was a restless doctor who was living in New Orleans at the time, uh, was one of those guys who was infected with gold fever and he headed west. So he took that southern route um, across uh, Yuma and across the Sonora Desert into California, and he passed through the Salton Sink. Um, he did not make it rich in gold, um, but he stayed in California and he really became obsessed with the idea of developing a large commercial irrigation project to irrigate those fertile lands from the soil deposits of the Colorado River. Uh, today we call it Imperial Valley and I'm going to refer to it as Imperial Valley for the remainder of the presentation. By 1859, just a couple years later, he had uh, completed survey works and identified an alignment for a gravity feed canal uh, that would serve the Imperial Valley. And he petitioned the state of California, and they actually approved giving him 16,000 square miles of land between the Colorado River and what is Palm Springs today. Uh, and they just told him he needed to get federal concurrence on that land transfer. Later that same year, he gets a bill in front of the U.S. House of Representatives, and members of the House can agree if that land is really totally worthless, so they table the bill. Well, just about a year later, 1861, the Civil War broke out and the subject of uh, development in the West was tabled until well after the war ended. So Wozencroft did not make it uh, ever live to see the commercial water development in the Imperial Valley. He is recognized as the first person uh, to develop a serious irrigation project for the for Imperial Valley. So Western migration continued to be slow uh, to try to entice um, Americans to, to the West. The Homestead Act of 1862 was enacted. Under the act, you could get 160 acres of land for a small filing fee. You had to improve the land uh, within five years and the bar was pretty low. You had to clear some land, um, build some kind of structure, um, pretty low bar, but 
Um, it's a lot harder than it sounds because you were in the middle of nowhere and you were very far from any resources that you couldn't get directly from the land. But between 1850 and, eight, and 1900, uh, the number of farms in the, in the West uh, grew from 1.4 million to 5.7 million. And migration to the desert Southwest though was non-existent. You can see here on the map. There was nobody settling there. That region was considered to be just uninhabitable. So the Civil War ended in 1865. The country was working past the reconstruction period and the federal focus came back to the manifest destiny, expanding and, and settling the West. Um, 1869, John Wesley Powell, who was a one-armed Civil War veteran, he actually lost his arm on the first day of battle in the Civil War. Um, and he was an Illinois geology professor. He actually privately funded an expedition to document the Colorado River route from the Green River in Wyoming down to the Yuma Crossing. So uh, in May of 1869, with four boats and 10 men that he pulled together and provisions for 10 months, they set out from Wyoming. Um, they didn't actually know what the distance was because the river was completely uncharted. Well, within the first month, they lost one of their boats and a quarter of their provisions. Um, by the second month, four of the men had left the party um, and um, they only had two boats left. They'd lost all their scientific equipment and now the trip was really just about survival. Uh, they made it through the Grand Canyon um, at August 31st, they reached the Mormon town of St. Thomas, which is in Nevada, about 300 miles north of Yuma. Um, St. Thomas was the only city that was eventually inundated in the filling of Lake Mead after the construction of Hoover. And there's no photos from this expedition. But the story of this great adventure uh, made it into newspapers all over the country. I mean, newspapers were essentially the television of the day and people followed this story. He did speaking engagements and that led to Congress appropriating funds for a second expedition. So Powell gathered up another group with the lessons that he'd learned. He was better prepared and set off in 1871 and had a successful scientific expedition. So important to the reclamation story is the geologic and survey data that he collected on this trip that mapped the Colorado River Basin. So in 1879, um, Powell published his report, Lands of the Arid Region. Um, remember, we have the Manifest Destiny, so conquering nature and reclaiming those arid lands of the West through irrigation fit right in with uh, how people were thinking at the time. So Powell's work in organizing and standardizing surveys led to the establishment of the USGS in 1879. And Powell was the second director of, of USGS. He served from 1881 to 1884. Um, I think of this kind of as the start of the Bureau of Reclamation story. Um, and as an aside, Powell was a really interesting guy. Uh, in addition to collecting survey and geologic data and plant and mineral specimens on all of his expeditions, he made really detailed notes about all the Native Americans that he encountered along his travels. And this led in 1879 to him being named the first director of the Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian Institution. And he served in that job until uh, 1902. So it's the mid 1800s, the railroads are starting to connect the West to the East. In 1877, Southern Pacific Railroad completed a rail bridge across uh, the Colorado at Yuma, connecting Arizona to California. They continued to build from west to east, and by 1883, the rail line connected to New Orleans. So this was increasing the interest in homesteading out west um, because now there was an ability to move crops uh, cost effectively and in a timely manner from the West to the Eastern markets where there was you know, a lot of demand. So the interest in solving the Imperial Valley irrigation problem kind of grew because it was starting to seem like a really valuable resource and the railways ran right through um, Imperial Valley. So in 1888, 
um, the Senate passed a resolution and it directed the Department of Interior to identify some possible res reservoir sites in the West and it assigned that responsibility to USGS. In 1890, uh, Powell presented his report to the Senate Select Committee on Irrigation of the Western Arid Lands, and they were really anxious to hear about these massive reclamation projects that were going to uh, help with development of uh, industry and agriculture in the West. And Powell presented the map that you see there on the right, and it is um, largely considered to be the first environmental map that was ever developed in the United States. It was a new way of visualizing how the water and the land relate to each other. It showed large watershed basins that had nothing to do with state lines. Um, and he explained that the natural phenomenon take precedent over state or political lines. And he recommended dividing the watersheds into political boundaries for the purposes of managing the water. And he cautioned that there was only enough water in the Colorado River Basin to irrigate a small fraction of the lands. And that is not what they wanted to hear. And he essentially got booed out of the Senate chamber. Um, pretty prophetically as part of that um, speech to Congress, he told them that if there was not restraint used in exploiting the water, there would be a heritage of conflict and litigation over water rights. So under the 10th Amendment, the use of land is within, within states is a state issue. Uh, there is no provision in the Constitution on how to manage interstate resources, and water is common, and it's often an interstate resource, and it couldn't be treated like land. Um, and there was no consensus, though, on how to manage it, and there was no consensus on what role the federal government should play in managing water. Mark Twain pretty famously said that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting, and the scarcity of water in the West really exacerbated the conflicts. So in the early 19th century, um, there had already been voluminous litigation over water rights. Uh, there were several cases that had made their way all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1894, uh, Congress attempted to somewhat deal with the issue by passing the Cary Act. Um, that allowed for private development of irrigation systems in the Western states, and the developers could sell that water for profit. While well, Western politicians were not satisfied with this, they kept pushing for federally funded water reclamation programs, and the West was not alone in wanting federal dollars to fund, to, to fund these larger and larger infrastructure projects that were needed as the country developed. Um, no surprise, there were heated arguments in Washington uh, over what projects should take priority and what regions of the country were most important to receive those dollars. So those that were seeking the federal investment for Western water projects finally found an ally in President Theodore Roosevelt. In 1902, Roosevelt signed the National Recre Recreation Act into law I think many of you know that Reclamation Service was originally formed under USGS, and in 1907 it was made an independent bureau. Um, unlike the Cary Act, the projects, the Reclamation projects were going to be developed using federal money, and the project costs would be repaid to the federal government by the water users. Uh, not to jump too far ahead of where we're at in the story, um, very quickly it became apparent that um, the loans were not being able to be repaid just through the sale of water. And by the 1930s, it had been proven that hydroelectric, um, uh, hydroelectricity was the way to generate enough money to repay the loans and to cover ongoing operation and maintenance costs. So 1894, using the Cary Act, uh, developers started a design for a commercial irrigation project in Imperial Valley, and they quickly went bankrupt. It was hard to get investors in this largely undeveloped area. Uh, it took it would take a lot of money to do the development, and while the payout could be bit, could be really huge, the risks were really high, and the amount of money needed to develop a project was also really high. 
1896, California Development Company took over that bankrupt project and they secured enough funding to start construction. Um, investor, uh, so George Chafee, he was a former Great Lakes shipbuilder turned developer, um, invested in the project, but kind of on the cheap. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that he did, uh, he was actually the developer in California of the area that's known as Ontario. He had renamed that and the first thing he told them is, if you want people to move here, we have to change the name because who wants to live in a place called Salt and Sink? Um, and he, she is the one who named it Imperial Valley. So a couple of the things they did to lower the cost of the project, you can see up here there's a canal that runs in the United States, is they said, well, we can build just a short, short um, channel here and then tie into what was a natural dry riverbed that flowed to the low area of the Salton Sink from times when the Colorado River jumped its bank in history. So they could save a lot of money on excavation. The other thing they did was they built a temporary wooden inlet structure. Um, they were planned to build a, the permanent concrete inlet structure once the money started flowing in from the sale of water. So word spread about these irrigation projects. There was interest in land grants through the Homestead Act. And between 1901 and 1905, the population of Imperial Valley grew from um, just a little over 100, which were mostly uh, people tied to the railroad, to over 12,000. And in 1901, the Imperial Irrigation Project started delivering water. So 1903, Reclamation authorizes its first five projects, and among them is the Salt River Project in Arizona. Uh, Roosevelt Dam was one of the Salt River, River Project facilities, and it rose to the top of the Reclamation Project list because the landowners had formed the Salt River Valley Water Users Association, and they had a cooperative agreement on how they would donate the land, share in the water, and pay back the project costs. In well, 1905, they started construction um, on uh, Roosevelt Dam. And about a year into construction, the cost of oil skyrocketed and the cost of running the generators was blowing up the project budget. So they decided, well, they could save a lot of money if they installed their own uh, power at the facility. And so by 1906, they were generating all of their project power and by 1909 they were delivering power to Phoenix, Phoenix and this actually makes Roosevelt Dam Reclamation's first multi-purpose facility. So Yuma took note of what was happening over there in Salt River and in 1903 they, they formed the Yuma County Water Users Association. Um, in 1904 the Yuma project was authorized. It's the first reclamation project on the Colorado River and uh, it, it included Laguna Dam, which is about 17 miles north of Yuma, um, and, which is a diversion structure and a siphon that ran under the river to the Yuma Canal system. So what Reclamation did in these projects was they bought up the existing features and combined them and improved it all as one uh, system. So Salt River and Yuma projects are actually the the start of modern agriculture in Arizona. Interestingly, I think in 1904-1905 Reclamation annual, annual Report, um, they included a description of a project and a map that showed an all-American canal from Laguna Dam to Imperial Valley. It was a 15 and a half mile long tunnel and through the sand dunes, and they estimated the cost to be $20 million and they described it as not financially viable. So back to Imperial Valley, uh, California development, they continued to struggle financially. Um, the migration and settlement was growing faster than they anticipated. Um, they had the problems of the heavy silt load constantly clogging up the canals uh, in their system. They were actually having to do dredging around the clock to keep the canals open. Um, and they just didn't have enough money to cover the maintenance costs. There were lawsuits in the first couple of years um, for crop losses uh, because they couldn't meet all of their contractual water deliveries. 
And in 1904, a group of farmers petitioned to have reclamation take over the project. Um, there was no way for the federal government to take over ownership, though, since most of that project is down here in Mexico. Um, just real quickly, the way it works is up here at Pilot Knob next to Yuma, there's that diversion structure. It flows through this canal and then there's a series of gates. The water flows into all the individual uh, water districts. And then these are naturally low dry riverbeds that will overflow from the irrigation uh, flows there and it just uh, evaporates. And here is where Laguna Dam is and started construction there in 1905. So what went really wrong? Uh, 1904, um, there's 80 miles of main canal, over 700 miles of distribution canal. Uh, you have the ongoing problems of silting and the engineers say the only way to fix it is to build a new concrete diversion structure at Yuma. Well, to do that, they need some way to temporarily divert water off the Colorado into their irrigation system. And the shortest route is to jump across here in Mexico, and they called that the Mexico Cut. Um, in October of 1904, they open up the cut. It's basically just a ditch. Um, they start construction up in Yuma. Um, early 1905, so a couple months into construction, there's three unusual winter storms, causes record high flows on the Colorado. Each successive storm was widening that Mexico cut. And by the third storm, there was so much water flowing into their system that for the first time, water was flowing all the way to what we refer to today as the Salton Sea. <laughs> well, they realized they better get that closed before high summer flows. So between March and June, they make three different attempts. They almost get the cut closed off. Flash floodings come down and destroy it. Um, they can't even attempt to close it during the summer. And during the high flows of the summer, the, grew cut, the cut grew from what was a 45 foot wide cut to over 300 feet wide. It went from seven feet deep to 20 feet deep and two thirds of the Colorado River was flowing through the irrigation system to the Salton Sea and it was filling up at a pretty alarming rate. Finally, in October, they get, it, they get the cut closed. It fails again in November and now the entire Colorado River was flowing through the Imperial Irrigation System and the, the river to Mexico was dry. Uh, they had asked Reclamation throughout this process to help. All, in, all Reclamation could do was offer engineering device, uh, advice because all the work in, was in Mexico. So January 1907, the situation almost going on two years in is nearing being irreversible and going to destroy the Imperial Valley. Um, Pacific Railroad had been loaning money to Colorado development kind of from the start of this whole issue because they had big investments. They had all their rail lines running through there, uh, but they said we're done investing. President Roosevelt actually called the president of Pacific Railroad and he gave them kind of a quasi promise that he would you know, ask Congress to reimburse them for whatever it costs to fix this. With that, they went back to work. They started diverting trains, over 1,100 trains from all over the West to just bring in as much rock and fill. And finally, in February 1907, they got the breach closed. The river had flowed into the Salton Sea for almost two years. Um, it was now 15 miles wide, 50 miles long, and Pacific Railroad was never actually reimbursed for any of that. So there's national. This is a national news story, um, and so no one's moving to the Imperial Valley. No one's wanting to invest in the region at all. Um, and uh, to try and get that interest drummed up in 1907, President Roosevelt championed in a, an address to Congress uh, the wonders of you know being able to develop Imperial Valley, and to build some storage reservoirs on the Colorado River, and it did not amount to anything. Um, 1909, Colorado River development is completely bankrupt. Um, they assign a receiver, and it was getting harder to ignore the risk of Imperial Valley and no federal investment. So finally, in 1910, Congress appropriated a million dollars 
uh, for President Taft to be able to fund levies in Mexico to protect Imperial Valley. A reclamation worked behind the scenes on that project because the Mexican government prohibited the U.S. from getting involved in uh, the construction in Mexico. 1911, the 13 independent Imperial Valley Water Companies, nervous about what was going to happen in this bankruptcy foreclosure, um, uh, formed the Imperial Irrigation District, which we refer to as IID. Um, IID consulted with reclamation on a diversion structure at Laguna Dam. In 1914, they put a, a proposal to the Secretary of the Interior and it didn't result in anything. In 1916, IID is the successful bidder at the foreclosure sale and they take over control of the, of the Imperial Irrigation Project. But they are on the case of trying to get federal involvement. So in 1920, Congress passed the Kincaid Act. Uh, that authorized the Secretary of the Interior to investigate problems of Imperial Valley. Uh, battle over water rights are escalating between the states. Um, and under the U.S. Constitution, states need congressional authorization in order to enter into compacts. And in 1921, Congress authorized the seven basin states to enter into a compact for sharing the water of the Colorado River. Secretary of Commerce Hoover, Herbert Hoover was assigned by President Harding to facilitate those negotiations. So February 1922, a couple months later, the Paul Davis report comes out. That was the report produced under the Kincaid Act, and it was submitted to Congress and it recommended two things, a construction of the All-American Canal and a high dam on the Colorado River at or near Boulder Canyon. Uh, the Boulder Canyon Project Act, the bill that ultimately approves uh, the construction, uh, was introduced to Congress, but without um, a water allocation agreement, the project was not going to go anywhere. So now the pressure's on to negotiate the compact. So in November, um, they, uh, the, the uh, commission reconvened and, and on November 24th, 1922, six of the seven uh, basin states agreed to the terms of the Colorado River Compact. And that's what actually serves as a law of the river today. Uh, Hoover's role in negotiating the compact is actually why the dam was ultimately named after him. So reclamation, said when they were initially studying, they'd been studying the Colorado River really since 1902 uh, when it was originally authorized um, and identified in Boulder Canyon two proposed preferred sites. Um, later surveys uh, indicated that Black Canyon, where we actually built Hoover Dam, was a better site. Uh, but the bill had been introduced as the Boulder Canyon Project Act and while we're in Black Canyon, we still operate as the Boulder Canyon project today. Uh, the dam design was evolving, evolving. And in the world of engineering, they were moving away from gravity dams to arch dams. Uh, among other things, uh, they take a lot less material, so that would lower the cost of projects. So reclamation was in the process, process of designing an arch dam for Black Canyon. And in the same time period, St. Francis Dam, which was just outside of Los Angeles, failed and it killed over 400 people. So they're designing a very similar dam for the Black Canyon and people were very nervous about that. Hoover was going to be more than 700, have be more than twice as tall as any other dam that had ever been built and it would impound more than 700 times as much water as St. Francis. So several actions were taken. Um, reclamation designers immediately started modifying their design so that they could strengthen um, all the redundancies and the safeguards in their design. The Secretary of Interior took the action of appointing an independent board of engineers and geologists that were going to review all of the reclamation designs. Uh, and they ultimately approved a gravity arch dam. And that's a combination uh, of an arch design and a gravity component. So on December 21st, 1928, President Calvin Coolidge signed the Boulder Canyon Project Act and that authorized the funding to build the project. 
Uh, a couple more things need to happen though before they can build the dam uh, besides finishing the design. Um, in 1930, uh, contracts for the sale of Hoover Power were completed. Um, that was essential because that's how they were going to repay the construction loan. Um, Reclamation also awarded contracts to bring the railway um, and power to the Black Canyon and a contract to build a road from what would be Boulder City, um, the encampment where the workers would live, down to the bottom of the canyon. Um, on March 4th, 1931, uh, a contract was awarded to six companies. It was a conglomerate that came together for the purpose of building the project. And the contract was for $48.9 million, and it was the largest single contract the federal government had ever awarded up to that point. Briefly touch a little bit on the people part of the Hoover construction story. So in 1931, the U.S. was in the thick of the Great Depression, and President Herbert Hoover directed the contractor to contractor to start construction as soon as possible to provide jobs. Part of the contract was they had to build a town that would house um, at least 80% of the workforce, but they hadn't anticipated needing a large number of workers until at least two years into the contract. Uh, what actually happened was as soon as the contract was awarded, thousands of unemployed uh, men immediately flocked to Las Vegas and to make the situation worse, um, while they had anticipated that men would come uh, mostly alone, which was typical of a remote construction site, they brought their families. And people were setting up unauthorized camps. They built shelters out of whatever they had brought with them or whatever they could find. Um, and the living conditions were really brutal at the beginning of the project. So with this situation, the government pretty much forced the contractor to start accelerate the construction of Boulder City. Um, it was constructed as a federal reservation and it was envisioned that it would be a temporary city and it was going to be demolished when construction was over. But the women had come and they were building a community that they'd be able to raise their kids in. And when construction was done, a lot of those families decided to stay. Uh, Boulder City was a federal reservation until 1959 when it was incorporated as a city in Nevada. So here's an overview of the Hoover Dam uh, site. Uh, first thing that they did uh, was blast out the uh, four 56 foot diameter diversion tunnels. They lined them with three feet of concrete. Uh, they built the upper and lower coffer dam so they'd be able to dewater the site. Uh, the, the diversion tunnels re were repurposed. The outer tunnels serve as part of our spillways and the inner tunnels hold our lower penstocks. So notice to proceed was issued on April 20th, 1931. On the left there, you can see one of the diversion tunnels. And on the right, you can see the dewatered dam site um, with the lower coffer dam there in the background. The picture on the left there shows removal of sediment uh, to get down to bedrock. And on the right, you can see placement of the first bucket of concrete, which was on June 6th, 1933. On the left, you can see the start of the foundation blocks. There is no rebar in the dam structure. Um, the blocks, each of those blocks range from 30, uh, 30 to 50 foot square, and they were about five feet deep. Um, each lift within that five feet was eight inches. Um, so to answer one of the most common questions on tours, there are no bodies buried in the dam. Even if you tried really hard, you couldn't bury yourself in eight inches of concrete. Uh, on the right, you can see progress in the first three months. Um, you can notice this slot line running up the center of the structure, and that was the last section of concrete to be filled in. So I mentioned the slot line on the last slide. Uh, curing concrete generates heat and reclamation engineers had estimated that it would take 100 years for the heat produced by this mass concrete placement to dissipate. And during that time, the concrete would shrink and cause cracking, probably over six inches over the width of the dam. Um, so to draw that curing heat off, they installed pipes in each of these blocks 
and they pumped ice cold water through uh, through that to draw that heat off and uh, speed up the curing. There's over 150 miles of pipe in total. Uh, the picture on the right shows the um, ice plant uh, that was uh, on the site that was pumping that ice water through the project 24 hours a day. The picture on the right or on the left there shows the dam uh, and the intake towers as it was nearing completion. Uh, the, there were some shelves blasted out on the canyon walls and that's what the intake towers sit on. They don't sit at the bottom of the lake. Uh, on the right there, you can see that is September 30th, 1935. That was dedication day. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt dedicated the dam and his dedication speech was broadcast on radio stations across the country. It was quite a big event. And famously in that speech, another bad impression here, um, this morning I came, I saw and I was conquered as everyone would be who sees for the first time this great feat of mankind. So here's a before and after um, Black Canyon in 1930 and then the Hoover Dam Black Canyon site in 1936. Um, how do we operate today? So we do not receive any appropriations. Uh, we have 46 power customer contracts. They're 50-year contracts. We have a 10-year operating budget that the power customers approve annually. Um, we make our money from 80% of our money comes from power sales, power-related sales, and the other 20% comes from visitor revenue, and a very small amount comes from the sale of water. Um, what do our customers pay for? Uh, they pay for the actual energy that we produce, and that's about 50% of our revenue. The other 50% comes from uh, spinning reserve and non-spinning reserve. So spinning reserve is when a generator is motoring, uh, dewatered, and it can start producing power in about 30 seconds. And non-spinning reserve is a unit that's available and can be brought online and start producing power in about four minutes. The other thing that they pay for is black start capability. So most uh, power plants need uh, electricity to start up their units. Um, Hoover Dam does not need outside power, so we are part of, if the grid went down, um, Hoover would be part of bringing that system back up online. The amount of electricity that we produce at Hoover is directly tied to and limited by downstream water orders. Um, our power customers are municipalities, irrigation districts, tribes, utility companies, and other federal agencies. We have 17 Francis turbine generators. Those are the power that goes out onto the grid. And this is our Pelton water wheel. That's our house power and what gives us the ability to uh, our Black Star capability. We produce about 7 billion kilowatt hours annually, and that's enough power to serve about 1.3 million people. So I mentioned in uh, President Roosevelt's proclamation on Dedication Day, I think it's still true. Um, for anyone who has ever been to Hoover Dam, you take the original construction switchback road uh, down into the canyon, and you come around a hairpin turn, and for the first time you can see the dam. And I think people still feel odd. I feel odd driving into work, um, uh, just seeing the dam for the first time. Hoover was designed right from the beginning to host public tours. We had our first public tours in April of 1937 and they cost 25 cents. Today, about five to six million people visit Hoover Dam every year, and that rivals any of the large national parks in the country. And about 700,000 of those people take uh, one of our power plant or dam tours. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Patty. Thank you so much, Terry. That was terrific. I too am awed every time I go out to Hoover Dam. Um, I just, it's like, I can't believe they pay me to come out here and work. <laughs> um, okay, now we have time for some questions. If you have a question, uh, please click on the question mark bubble in the upper right hand corner.
Let's see. Give some people time to put in any questions. I don't see any coming in yet. Hmm. I see something spinning. Oh, here we go. I just want to say that the statement made that the land being uninhabitable, it was inhabited by Native Americans that made a living out of crops that needed watering. How did how did we do it? I'm assuming that means how did they do it? Do you have any idea, Terry? Yes, um, so it was obviously a challenging environment. Um, I think the statement, I think that uh, that's, that perception was the European Eastern American settlement idea that it was unhabitable, but certainly there were thousands of years of Native Americans that inhabited that land. Um, so it was really rich land. Uh, they would do uh, furrow irrigation um, was how they managed it. And, uh, um, and and they, it was challenging for them too because you know their lands would flood and get washed out and they would often relocate, um, you know, uh, on an annual basis depending on where the river decided to settle. But that's how they that's how they lived through furrow farming, which was uh, dip digging channels off of the river and um, you know. Uh, uh, smaller canals to, to get the water to their fields. Great, thank you. How about, can you reiterate the connection between the Hoover Dam and the Imperial Valley Project? So the connection is, I don't think you would have, we would have ever gotten to a Hoover Dam project if it wasn't for the need to manage the river so that you could develop um, the farming in Imperial Valley. Uh, the river was very unpredictable so it was often flood or um, nearly dry conditions. Um, so the, the water was very unpredictable and having a reliable water storage and being able to manage the flooding was really the reason that Hoover Dam was included in that project. Great, thank you. Um, what is the design life of Hoover Dam? Um, so I believe that most of our projects were designed with 50 or 100 year design lives. Um, I'm not entirely certain what they were intending it to be, but I think it's going to last a lot longer than that. We're in year 80, going into year 85 here. Great. Um, I read that Boulder City didn't allow the families of Hoover Dam employees to use the hospital. Is that true? That is true. They had mm -hmm. to go into Las Vegas. Uh, they want to know if the tours are taking place again. Uh, so we were close to the public until um, about, uh, I can't even remember now, I think last October we, we started tours back up. We originally opened, we had the, just the exhibits open. We started tours. Um, the COVID uh, cases in we turned into red with high COVID transmissibility. So we stopped the tours, but our exhibits are open. Thank you. Uh, what is the generating capacity of the power plant at the current lower water levels? So our capacity, um, our, our um, nameplate capacity is 2,040 megawatts. Um, right now, it, when all of our generators are online, right now we're in maintenance season, so several of the generators are offline, is a little less than 1600 with the lower lake levels. Okay. Uh, how did they decide on the water allocation in the lower Colorado River? Why did they do it by volume rather than by percentage? And why did California get substantially more than the other states? I am not going to pretend to be an expert um, on this particular topic. Um, 
What I will say is California was the most populous. It was very contentious. Um, California was the most populous state at the time. Um, how they all came to that actual allocation, I am not the subject matter expert to speak to. I will say that um, the upper basin did not have to do their allocation at the same time. Um, and I think they learned from that it was better to do it by percentage by what they saw happening pretty quickly in the lower basin. So that's probably as much as I'm, that might be another whole presentation. <laughs> I think it is. The law of the river is very fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Um, could you discuss the name change from Black Canyon uh, to Hoover Dam? Yeah, so it was originally, so I think a lot of it just had to do with um, politics. Um, and so when they had the, um, um, it, it wasn't until the 40s when they finally named it permanently Hoover Dam. So it went from, it was never called uh, Black Dam. It was Boulder Dam and then Hoover Dam and Boulder Dam and Hoover Dam um, until finally they officially named it Hoover Dam. Great. Uh, does Hoover Dam have the same problem that Glen Canyon Dam has with the penstocks potentially being too high in the water column to allow water to flow through the generators? Um, eventually, but we have more um, we have more time left right now than it sounds like is projected there. That's another presentation, probably. It is another presentation. Um, did you say that the power produced by the dam doesn't usually go to the grid? No. I, um, so we have our 17 generators are our commercial power. And we have the two Pelton water wheels, which are our house power. Does that answer that question? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, what will happen to the power generation and its customers when the reservoir hits Deadpool? Well, I can say that we're working very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, Why was the upper basin water allocations divided by per? Oh, we already did that one. Sorry, they they're switching order here. Uh, does the state of Colorado use all of its water right? If not, does it give freely to the other states? That's the upper basin. Um, I'm not sure how how much of their water is developed. How does tour revenue compare to water use revenues and total revenue for Hoover? Water is maybe 1%, one percent, one and a half percent of our revenue. It's it's a pretty small percentage. Do you know how close the current sediment dep deposition height is in the reservoir uh, to the water intakes? Mm -hmm. So we really, since Glen Canyon, we, we get very little sediment. So it really hasn't changed. Yeah, I've never heard of it being an issue. Have you? No. Yeah. Oh, here's a follow on to another question. Why were the dam employees, family members, not allowed to use the local hospital? Do we know why? Uh, that was just a six companies rule. I I never read why, but I just know that that was true. How is the current drought affecting Hoover Dam operations? You might be speaking to that more frequently than I am, Patty. I do. Um, in terms of water deliveries, um, we are delivering less water downstream because the the states are um, leaving water in Lake Mead to help uh, keep it from reaching critical levels. So we're delivering less water. Um, it's it's impacted the ability to create hydropower um, 
as efficiently because uh, they need the pressure from the reservoir when it's at a higher level pushes in the turbines. And so there's less pressure pushing and so they have to work harder. So our capacity is down by about 25%. Um, let's see, we just have a couple more minutes here. Uh, you mentioned that there's very little income generated from water sales. Why is there so little value placed on water back then, even when everyone obviously recognized the, the water, the area was arid and would require high water demand to sustain any agricultural activity? Gonna say I'm not the person to be able to answer to how they price water. I do not know. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, what was the daily pay for laborers at Hoover Dam? I do not. So different jobs pay different amounts of money, um, and I cannot recall off the top of my head what the various what the range was of pay okay looks like we're out of questions and we're just about out of time um we've received many many comments thanking you for your presentation terry and i would like to do the same thank you everybody for joining us um the next presentation is on november 18th and they're going to discuss the denver laboratories so once again thank you terry and everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, appreciate having the opportunity to present. Thanks everybody.